the Civil Rights Museum will no longer be part of 145, the development project that, if approved by the City Council, would be built in Harlem. But there's been a lot of opposition among many community members and local elected officials who are arguing that what the neighborhood really needs is more affordable housing. One of the critics of the plan is my next guest. Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine joins us to talk about that and much more. Thanks for being here. Good to see you. Great to see you too, Al. Let's start with land use. Well, what's wrong with the, the 145 project, do you think? Look, I can't support it in its current form, and we actually issued a uh, rejection of the proposal as the borough president's recommendation. Uh, the biggest problem is the level of affordability. There's just not enough units. They're not affordable to people at low enough incomes and other issues. I think the project could still be saved, but it's going to require a pretty dramatic reworking. Interestingly, the departure of the museum may actually create an opportunity to add more affordable housing for low-income residents. Um, and so I'm seeing this as a potential positive development. Uh huh. And, and as always, th there's the sliding scale. If you want deeper affordability, you end up with fewer units, right? I mean, what's the process by which we try and figure that out? Well, look, the developer is going to have to put more resources into the affordability, both number and income targets. The city could put some funding in as well. Um, in our report, we said we needed a minimum of 50% of the units to be affordable. Mm -hmm. We're a long way from that in the current proposal, so as I said, uh, can't support the current uh, configuration, but we could get there um, if all sides are willing to put in more. Got it. Uh, let's move on. The city has moved to a medium alert from low when it comes to um, uh, COVID uh, infection rates. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I know that Manhattan has the highest infection rate of any boroughs. And I, and I know that as chair of the health committee on the city council, you've been following this for a couple of years now. What is supposed to change now that this color has changed? Well, I know that we're all exhausted by this pandemic. I'm exhausted by it. And we've made so much progress since January. But uh, this is an important marker in a wave that is seeing increasing cases. Uh, Manhattan south of 96th Street has led this wave, and specifically young people. And so we do want to remind folks that COVID is still out there, and there are steps that everyone can take, should take, to protect themselves. I don't think we need the kind of drastic shutdowns that we've seen in the past, but I'd like to see the city do more to put resources into pushing back this pandemic. Um, one thing that we've called for is a campaign to promote booster shots. Um, they've really stopped. We're stuck at about 37%. Mm -hmm. The city really should be pushing that. We also want the city to help distribute resources to families to fight this wave. We've called for distribution of a COVID safety bag. I actually have an example yeah, of what, what we're calling for here. Every family should have something like this with high quality masks, with the digital thermometer, with um, self tests, with a uh, pulse oximeter. All of this should be in the hands of every household now mm -hmm. so that we don't get caught with long lines and shortages if this really gets bad. On the conservative side, let me take a look at that. Yeah. This, this has got to cost about 75 bucks maybe, right? Less. I mean, if you buy it in bulk, maybe you can push the a price down. Less. Yeah. yeah. Um, the pulse oximeter, I see, yeah, the, uh, the extra tests and so forth. Okay. Now, I, 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 there's, a, there's a very perceptible shift of uh, the pandemic as the responsibility of the government down to families as like this is now your problem you know we're going to give you a bag and sort of tell you how to use it and if you get uh, if you get COVID, that's on you that's not a particularly um great development is it well the city has to continue to support people who get COVID. um we closed the hotel isolation program i'd like to see that reopened as an example of the kind of resources we want back on the table the city has to make it easy to get tested easy to get treatment uh, easy to connect to a doctor if you don't have one. And uh, credit where it's due, the city, New York City has done better than most other parts of the country on that. Mm -hmm. You can call 212 COVID 19, get connected to a doctor, get screened for treatments like Paxlovid. And uh, that's better than other parts of America. But we need to put more resources on the table uh, because we're still in the midst of a wave and we want to protect New Yorkers. We want uh, to, perfect, to protect the city in the face of possible future waves. Yeah, I mean, isn't one reason that um, maybe the booster program is not going the way it should is aside from messaging, if there's no particular consequence to not getting boosted, if you can go everywhere, you can go to the theater, you can go into your office, you can go anywhere you want, um, you know, the, the government is sending out a piece of information, which is that, yeah, we think it's important, but we don't think it's so important that we're going to stop you from doing whatever you want. Yes, that's true. And if this wave gets bad or future waves get bad, where we see a rise in hospitalizations, those kind of mandates will be on the table. But I'll tell you, Errol, there are millions of people in New York City who got their first 
vaccine series and never got their booster shot. These are not anti-vaxxers. Mm -hmm. These are people that we can reach, I think, with some persuasion that um, can be brought to the table for boosters, but we don't have an aggressive campaign now, and that's what we're calling for. Okay. Um, let, let me uh, sh shift topics to uh, evictions. They are increasing. The moratorium has expired. Um, what is, is your office hearing complaints? What's the next step? Oh, my goodness, yes. I mean, we have uh, so many evictions in housing court in New York City now that it has overwhelmed the legal service providers. We passed right to counsel in New York City back in 2017. That right is being undermined today in housing court in New York City. It's going to lead to families losing their homes and winding up homeless. That will happen, Errol. We can fix this. The courts have to slow down the calendaring of new eviction cases so that it doesn't overwhelm the legal service providers. No case should move forward, Errol, if the tenant does not have an attorney. That is the proposition that we enshrined in law in New York City and is currently not being fulfilled in housing court. It sounds like there may be more money needed for legal services so that they can provide the attorneys or hire new ones. Long term, yes. But even if there were more money on the table, there just aren't enough attorneys to hire today and it would take time to recruit and onboard them. So in the short term, the only solution is to slow down the calendaring, calendaring of cases. In housing court, we're asking, demanding that the Office of Court Administration do that immediately. And the other side of that equation, of course, is a small, not particularly vocal, but very seriously hurt group, the small landlords, right, who are maybe two or three years behind on a lot yeah. of their rent. Yeah. Look, there is definitely a world of difference between a small family-owned building and the kind of corporate investment funds that own so much housing. And we do need to support small landlords through things like uh, helping them with mortgage payments if they're behind. Uh, we need reform of our property tax system to be fair to them. But, you know, an eviction is an eviction, and a family that loses their home could wind up homeless. And I think the basic principle is there's no fairness in housing court if both sides don't have an attorney. And the landlords have attorneys. It's the tenants we have to worry about, and that's the basic principle we have to adhere to. Um, vacant office space. Um, do you have a particular view about what should happen and on what schedule it should happen? Because there are a lot of, of big commercial owners who, they say that they're, they, they know that, you know, work from home is a, a new fact of life. They know things aren't gonna go back to the way they were, but they're not particularly pushing for any new zoning changes or making any big stra strategic moves, are they? Look, we have so many signs of the comeback of Manhattan's economy. Broadway's coming back. Hotel bookings are up. Uh, restaurants are, are, in most neighborhoods, doing well. In-person office space is an economic challenge for us because there are small businesses around every midtown Manhattan office building that are suffering now. We're only at about 35 or 40 percent occupancy. We've got to do better than that. We can do better than that. But as you say, the nature of office work has changed. And that's not a bad thing. In person and hybrid, they're going to live together, I think, indefinitely, and that will be good for work life balance. And that will allow, I think, some of the older, um, less desirable office buildings to be converted to housing, to affordable housing. But as you say, the city and state have to do much more to allow for uh, zoning changes and to put resources on the table. It's very expensive to convert office buildings. It's not going to happen unless we put money in. In our last minute before I let you go, our city notoriously has a lack of public bathrooms. Uh, you're planning to do something about it. Where, yeah. where this has always stumbled, by the way, is that, you know, what will the city's responsibility be? Who's going to keep them clean? Who's going to keep them safe? Who's going to keep them well lit and so forth? What's your plan? Um, it's just too hard to get a bathroom in New York City. Yes. It's outrageous. We are behind most other cities in the country and the world. It's a public health issue. It's an equity issue. I would say it's a human rights issue. So we have a bill. I'm pleased to be partnering with Councilmember Rita Joseph, who's uh, the sponsor in the council, that would require a public bathroom in every zip code. Mm. Now, there are models which are self-cleaning and require very little staffing, not zero staffing, but mostly these things run themselves. Um, there are models out there like the one on the sidewalk next to Madison Square Park that prove this is possible. Let's roll it out citywide. Okay, sounds good. You'll be very popular if you can fix that one. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks very much Cheryl. for coming by. Good to see Great you. To see